this is about buildings and cities and we're still we're talking about Gaudi again we're going to talk about the late early career or the early mid career yeah why don't we just get straight into it Let's get stuck in. I'm George Gingell. I'm Luke Jones. I don't think we said that. And we're going to talk about the pl- at some length, I think, about the Guel Palace, the Palau Guel, uh, which is a big city centre palace, uh, kind of consciously modelled on the Italian palazzo, among other points of reference, for his major cl- uh, aristocratic client. This guy actually was was he an aristocrat at this point, or was he just an industrial aristocrat? I'm not sure. He was going to be an aristocrat. Yeah. Uh, I think he could safely say it was on the cards. Yeah. Uh, a band called Eusebi Guell, who is kind of, yeah, also like Gaudi himself, a complex character with various layers and things to unravel. I know nothing about him. Why yeah. didn't you could tell well, me something about Well, we, can, that, we, can, talk a, we can talk a little bit about him. So his, and to say that, I mean, so the palace was, it was built uh, between 1886 and 1888, it is a very much a kind of money no object type of project. This and is in this is a high degree of luxury. Yeah. Conspicuous consumption. And yeah, it's visitable and it's one of the you know, one of a number of major Gaudi attractions on the Gaudi Barcelona itinerary. So to say something about Count Guell, he's normally described as a kind of industrial tycoon. He liked to describe himself, I think, as a self made man, using the English term. Aha. Uh-huh. Um, but he was. He was. But didn't he inherit a load of money? Yeah, he inherited a lot of, quite a lot of money. Yeah. Self-made, like uh, I think Donald ma- Trump. Maybe he meant that his father was a self-made man. In fact, so I mean to say. To, uh, yeah, self-made like Donald Trump. Then. Yeah. <laughs> so his father, Ju- he, uh, his father Juan was uh, what they called an Indiano, what in England would have been called a colonial. He was a guy from the countryside who had gone to Cuba, and made his pile through various sorts of uh, commercial activities, including slavery, in the 1820s or something like that. And then he came back, I think, in the mid-1830s with a lot of money and invested that money into in setting up new industrial businesses as part of the big wave of kind of industrialization that was going to take off in a big way in so Catalonia. how old was he when, like, he had his child? Uh, his father, this guy was born in 1846, so I guess he must have had him quite late. Yeah, I mean, some people do get to it quite late on. Yeah, um, but I mean, if he was making his money in the 1820s, it yeah, that's, be. I'm pretty sure that's it. I think he went there in the late 18 teens and he came yeah. back to Catalonia in the mid 1830s or something like that. Yeah, that's by what I remember from doing the reading quite recently, but uh, yeah, so he's like a sort of second generation oligarch, and I think also like was someone who found making money quite easy and had lots of ideas about how to do it. So the father had invested in lots of industries. They had steel, they had cloth, they had all of those kind of classic I think things. at this time, there were lots of things you could invest money in that would yield profitable returns. Yeah. Eusebi himself, he was normally referred to as Count Guell, although I'm not sure when he was actually ennobled. I think it was a bit after this. He was kind of a self-styled renaissance man as well like to paint he was very much an outdoorsman i've got a little caricature of him a contemporary caricature of him like bringing home big baskets full of mushrooms wearing a crown yeah wearing a crown with like and some a strange dotty silk cravat yeah he's a, like a dapper dandyish kind of guy with some sort of gaudyish things in the background i don't know i think that there's probably other layers of stuff to decode there which i don't quite get you can see some of that and he yeah he was a kind of a I think he had some kind of dandyish qualities to his the way that he presented himself. Although I think he's still like eminently respectable. There is a family chapel in the house and all of that kind of thing. And in certain respects, kind of a hipster, or what we would now call one. Which I think, especially in the choice of site for the house, which is in what was then and would remain for at least a hundred years, like quite a kind of gritty, slightly seedy bit of the old city, which he was sort of consciously trying to. Gentrify? Kind of gentrify, yeah. Like, create, create a, a sort of sense of it as a, as a I mean, a place this one it. actually is in town. Yeah. Many, many of the buildings we'll talk about have utterly different circumstances of their site to when yeah. they were built. Yeah. Uh, which can make their interpretation difficult when Gaudi is someone who is really very interested in... Inha- a building kind of inhabiting its site and responding to it. Yeah. And the sites have changed completely... Yeah. In many cases, 
Not in this one. No, this one is still very much hemmed in by the kind of dirty old city. And I had a picture of his... I haven't really got anywhere with, like, unravelling the various industrial concerns of um, Count Guell, but there's a famous factory called the Vapor Vell, which I think made Corduroy, yep. if I've understood the Wikipedia page correctly. The big one also outside town that the colony and the chapel, the crypt and all that was also making Corduroy, I think. Yeah, which is obviously very profitable at the time, uh, and which is bits of that factory is still still around and have been redeveloped as something or other. Anyway, he kind of conceives this project of having a big kind of urban palace. They already had the this house out, which was then sort of outside the city, although just within the within the grid, which we talked about uh, with the pavilions. Yeah, he owned, I think, a house in the city and he kind of bought up a much larger site, which at the time I think had about 17 different much smaller houses or apartments on. In my readings um, of this, people keep saying modest restricted site yeah it's not that much i mean so there like, were 17 families living on this site and who <laughs> had to find somewhere else to live uh <laughs> yeah it's, uh, it's it's, it's it, like um, yeah 400 square meters or something yeah crown it's small for a palace maybe a little bit it's i would say it's a, a good solid italian palazzo size yeah not like literally the biggest it's yeah. Possibly a bit smaller. It's a bit smaller than the Medici Palace, I would say. Yeah. So I think we should kind of kind of get into talking about it. But like it like those Italian palazzos, like the kind of things we talked about on the Palladio episodes and things like that. Um it is in a narrow street and uh it takes a particularly the like front facade, um the front facade takes a sort of position on how to work within that sort of context and the building itself also has to respond to the fact that the site is sort of hemmed in on both sides and you know has to think about how to get light into the plan and all of these these kind of conventional I would say functionally it isn't quite the same as a palazzo it's a palazzo where the party bit has taken over everything except for a small percentage yeah it's a a house which is all about impressive entertaining I would say Grand entrance, grand presentation, big state rooms, yeah, and then a kind of flat at the top, yeah, for living in, yeah, but like very much a machine for parties, and um you know designed with arrival in mind it's so it's it's designed with this like double entrance which you're meant to be able to drive your carriage into, and there is under you know underground parking. Yeah, uh... yeah. This was the periods of the um, uh, usually single story underground carriage park. Yeah, not something that we uh, have today. I'm trying to remember what the flooring is here. It's is it timber cobbles they've got? You had there are these sort of particular floorings that you would use in your kind of um, indoor carriage parking. I think that I think there is some end grain timber cob. um, Yeah, I think I think that's it. I'm, I'm trying to remember whether it was that or rubber, which is also you, you do do also find in some of these uh, some of these buildings. But yeah, it's got um, like a kind of double ground story, the sort of double height arches going in, and then the first the kind of first floor, the like n- the noble floor, is either two one or two floors ab- above. It's like it's yeah, the it's, kind it's of- funny because the double arches don't do what you'd think they'd do, which is lead on to a courtyard. No. In the grammar of these things, he's he's doing various things to he's taking a type yeah. and upsetting the grammar of it in various ways. And normally yeah. you'd have a big arch that would go to a, a kind of space that would be the thickness of the wall. Yeah. A thickness of the building and then on the other side that would be the courtyard. Yeah. It doesn't. Well, but sort of there's a kind of double road going to a ramp which then goes, goes down. down into the underground. Um, and there is one small light well right at the back, which does go all the way down to the bottom. But the, where you would expect the courtyard to be, there is um, there is actually like a kind of triple height room, but only from the first floor above. And it's kind of, it's separated from you when you're on the ground floor. I guess that the way we'll probably talk about this building is to, we can look at the, we can talk a little bit about the, the section and the way it's sort of organised. And then we'll probably sort of go up through the vertical hierarchy from the bottom to the top. Which would we're going to be classy be, people. We're going to arrive yeah. by carriage. Yeah, that's the that's not none of this. None of this pedestrian riffraff. Yeah, the 
building has an astonishing range of different materials in it. Every type of stone, every type of wood. The kind of texture and feeling of each bit that you're going through at any particular moment is extremely specific uh, to that kind of that kind of bit. So the the bottommost story and the the kind of the interior of that carriageway in is this like very glossy, reflective, cold, uh, grey stone. I think this is the stone that is from the well, one of the Guel wine estates. Yes, quarried that, it out. Yeah, so. It's a very, it's like very hard, cold, reflective stone, and then um, you can achieve a high polish. And must have been every millimeter of this building says a lot of work's been put into this. It's all like designed within within like an inch of its life, and it's yeah. um, it's the start of this thing that you see, you know, also in later projects like the Sagrada Familia, where there are there's this kind of total sculptural fusion going on in in some of the elements yeah. so the way in which the the it, there's this sort of slight overhang with some columns in the in the in the kind of carriageway through which sort of um is on top of what what must be the sort of footway on one side and the way in which the columns like merge both with the ground below and with the sort of overhang thing above is very complex and kind of complete it's like it's all yeah it's it's like the, 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 there's a kind of dual capital one of which is the top part of which is um, continuous with the wall that it's yeah. supporting. Um, and this detail actually is used several times in the building. It's used on yeah. the gallery around the stairs and things. So, yeah, the section is... Well, the lower bit of the building is a little bit hard to talk to capture in the plans because it's sort of on, like, offset levels. You, the kind of way up goes goes onto a kind of mezzanine and then up to another... But, yeah, basically, there's this kind of basement all the way underneath. There's this, like, double-height ground story... And then the rest of the building is sort of circling around this big triple height uh, kind of void in the middle of the section. Yeah, my impression is that the ground two floors, and um, I've not actually been to this building, Mm. Luke has, but my impression is that the two floors are about kind of two things. The the ground, it's about this route um, down and up, up for pedestrians, up to the important bits, and down uh, with your carriage into this kind of cellar, and then wrapped around that actually is kind of service space. Yeah. Various utility rooms that in turn also have circulation going up to the party floor. Yeah. Um, So it's kind of about arrival and utility. But that circulation has a lot of, because it's, you know, going up and down at the same time. Uh, 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 and then at the bottom, you've got very expressed sculpture. You've got a lot of opportunities for kind of expressive form. Yeah. And also, you've got a lot of opportunities to kind of express material hierarchy. Yeah. So like, uh, the the, What's the, the yeah. lower depths yeah. are, oh. are something, carriage land is something, and um, walking is obviously very cocooned, Yeah. graceful, polished, Carriage land is quite polished, but very hard. Yeah, and then the cr- the kind of crypty, yeah, so the, uh, undercroft is uh, about this very rough, but also about like a crypt, the expression of the kind of weight that's on it. Yeah, there's a complete. So the the under story is completely like raw brick. Um, they're these sort of mushroom columns that get bigger at the top, and then they have these sort of springing. Um, arches which i think have some i think that's a bit of catalan vaulting isn't it in yeah the, in between them catalan vaulting is where you have um tiles two layers of tiles with like hard mortar between them and yeah. that you can kind of form like monocoque shells with it like yeah it allows you to form structural arches with a relatively thin material yeah maybe with the form work yeah um it's i mean on its own a very cool very cool extremely atmospheric space I mean, already, like, from one thing to another, from, like, the entrance to here, you've experienced this, like, extremely strong kind of contrast in textures and things. I guess if you were really, like, a noble person, you wouldn't follow the carriage down, though, would you? Get out and get straight upstairs. I think that's correct. But I also think he would... You would want to show it off, wouldn't you? It would be shown off because an enormous amount of effort's gone into it. It's just... I think he would show it off to a lover of art. 
that there's a lot of forms in a small amount of space. This complicated spiral staircase. Yeah. Everything is fat and strong. The bricks corble out, and we're beginning to get the like the kind of roughness of um, Gaudi brick just kind of keeps escalating through his life. Yeah. Uh, but we're already getting to like quite rough brick. The main way in, you go up in the middle, and then you kind of go left, and then you sort of wrap around. The, these two two like main flights of stairs which are slightly cranked sort of you go from like low to high so there's a sort of slight compression of the ceiling height on the mezzanine and then it kind of expands up again uh, that means that you're sort of heading back towards the light coming in from the street which is like the main s- source of illumination uh, through the elevations and um, it also means that you then like enter those the three uh, sort of Um, entertaining rooms at the front of the house from one end so you can kind of go through them in sequence but also you're going through a succession of spaces that are like priming you for the wow factor of the room upstairs you're kind of being turned so that your view is like broken up yeah the space is compressing in still very sumptuous materials like yeah complicated polychrome polished stone floor yeah. Lots of stuff going on. And the compressed space, which is still not exactly... It's not like still not domestic scale, even the small height, is at no point like dark and compressed. Like elements of it are dark, elements of it are compressed. And that's priming you yeah. to make the most of your arrival. Yeah. Like everything's different. All the windows are different. There's so much design in this house. Yeah. it's 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 really over the top but there you go it's you, you can tell it's designed like by a maniac yeah um, because it's not off it's not like loads and loads of off-the-shelf detail some details are reused to kind of have a through language although not to a very great extent and yeah. it's just very there's a lot going on there so then the first floor which is well yeah we'll call it the first floor the kind of piano noble which is the this yeah. kind of upper level above the kind of entrance deck is there's a particular approach to the plan to the section to to all kinds of stuff that is that sort of needs to be unpicked going kind of front to back there are these three rooms across the front of the house which is sort of slightly which are kind of elongated a bit and then there's a big central space which goes all the way up to the roof um, and which has some circulation within it and also has like an organ and various other things. And then there's like a series of rooms at the back again, which are looking onto this inter- internal light well. And they're also like cantilevered out a little bit at the front. Um, there's a sort of shallow sort of corbelled out bit. I mean, there's a series of strange elements on the front facade. You don't necessarily appreciate all of them because you don't really, see, it's quite hard to see all of it from the street or from anywhere really this first floor kind of gallery has this whole kind of row of like slightly different very tall windows all in a row to create something who's with the effect of which is almost a little bit like a curtain wall but 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 not quite but also like a cloister yeah it's um like the glazing onto a cloister like like there's a lot of strong verticals there's lots of stone columns yeah there's a certain amount of sort of tracery like yeah and then in terms of type, this is the 18th, 19th century party breakout gallery on the edge of big room, um, yeah. which is a sort of established type where you've got like your big entertaining room and then through a kind of semi-permeable screen, there's a kind of place that you can go be half in and half out and kind of yeah. chat and Yeah, well, cause, so it's kind of layered. There's the actual layer of the facade and then there's an internal layer of columns, which is actually a double layer. Yeah. So it creates, yeah, there's definite potential for a little bit of light canoodling, I would say. Yeah, or conspiring one. or whatever it yeah. is that you do. Well, the other thing about the first floor is that it particularly is very dense with layers of, like, historical reference. And so one of the ones here, like this gallery, there are various places in the house that this is true. I think this is also a kind of Orientalist idea. There's, like, a special sort of gallery that you're meant to have that the women can, like, look out of. Yeah, because they're kind of cloistered. They're not meant to come. They're not meant to come out generally, or only under certain circumstances. But they can kind of look down into the spaces that 
like men are occupying and various the kind of public life of the house is going on in i don't know about how they do it in north africa or southern but it, 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 no i think in, it, i think it's a kind of murgle ottoman, thing i've oh yeah maybe ottoman, um, yeah. architecture they have it but it tends to be you've got a long room at one end of that you've got a gallery yeah uh with a screen yeah you can kind of look into the the like room with the big bench around it which is kind of different yeah. It also actually reminds me of Tudor Revival English. Yeah. The this thing that you have like jetting out. Yeah. It's got this kind of pairing on either side and they would also in London houses of this period you have this space which is kind of separated off from the entertainment room. Yeah. And it's got that boxy quality kind of ingle nook, isn't it? It's the like space between Yes. Ingle nook window window nook. Uh, but kind of grand version. I yeah. think actually there's an awful lot of historic reference in this building, but it's mixed. Yeah, it's very synthesized. There are bits where you can really sort of spot the references happening. Yeah, so there's, the, I mean, there's this one. I think elsewhere there are bits which feel like they're almost quoted. Uh, so some of the ceilings, for example, on this floor are these like big ornate wooden ceilings which are feel like quite conscious kind of medieval castilian yeah. kind of quotations yeah um, uh there's a dome which feels like it's one of various sorts of domes yeah uh um, but most stuff is very synthesized and mixed together yeah there's and real then, goth but, i mean these like thin columns that make up the thing they're not gothic something we should have mentioned earlier is that he is using here make a lot of use of the tall parabolic arch the yeah. first entrance ways are this tall parabolic arch i mean i don't know if like if they're exact parabolas or whatever i think a lot of them are and that's a curious thing because it feels a bit gothic because mm. it's kind of pointy pointy but it's definitely not gothic it feels a bit alien yeah feels a little bit oriental as well a little bit oriental or even kind of african yeah it's also very tall in some yeah. cases. The ones going in are quite strong and, and brutal and arch, you know, um, thick, heavy. Yeah. But up on these higher levels, um, they are, you know, a column goes up and becomes a very extended arch. Yeah, it's very strange. And then there's and there's a kind of series of different variations of this it, that go on in the in the different spaces. The um, this kind of like deep screening element. Uh, yeah, there's one where it's a kind of tripod column, three of them together going up. There's one where they're single columns where it kind of mushrooms out at the top and then kind of fuses in this, or not really fuses, kind of intersects with the parabolic arch coming down. Boolean union. Yeah, it's a really weird, <laughs> like weird, really, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to say about it, except that I can't really understand exactly how you would design <laughs> how you would come up with that as an as a uh, as an idea like, well um, i mean actually i think the way you do it is that he's using for these arches it's, it's just an uneducated theory he's using geometry yeah and it and it, i think it really is just the union of two shapes yeah and the way you describe it is this cone goes up yeah. in this shape and until it, it meets this arch yeah which projects down but why is there a cone on top of the column? It's a sort of capital that looks cool. <laughs> yeah. It's also a kind of inversion of the tall parabolic arch. I guess, yeah. I get, I'm, yeah, sure. Things pointing up and pointing down. And it's also kind of a go-faster stripe. Yeah. To make the tallness taller. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, some of the unions are a little bit... Are they a bit awkward or they produce quite strange effects? But yeah, it's funny it? because some of it is like, you know, the bottom of the column is like flamboyant gothic revival, sort of. Yeah, but then, and then the, the then, top yeah. is much more sci-fi. Yeah, kind of sci-fi Taj Mahal kind of vibe. Yeah, but like the referencing is much looser and then the ceiling is... Very elaborate. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> Do you want to go through that? I mean, the ceiling looks like something from <laughs> looks the Palace of, Palace of Westminster or something. It's like extremely gold, gothic with... Um, uh, I mean, it's like a wood uh, grid 
very gilded with big expressed kind of corbels supporting it and with um, those sort of pendant like drippy gothic bits kind of acting a little bit like bosses but not but also in lots of other places as well the whole thing is almost like a kind of super gothicized gold space frame or something like that and it's like that. enormously deep you know you've got the the ceiling level yeah but below that there's it's hard for me to judge but like maybe a meter and a half of grid decoration yeah which is you know there's a kind of like grid at the bottom uh with things lots of decorative things hanging from it and then at the intersections of the grid it goes up in a column and then there's cross bracing made of twiddly turned things and then at the top the ceiling level itself is sculpted into kind of points and then the level of the is, level of craft, a lot. of craft and finish in every element is absurd. There's a lot <laughs> of man hours in there. Yeah, no, this is real money is no object kind of money is no object kind of architecture. Or the, I mean, there's another ceiling which has got like um, this is one of the ones which I thought ha- had a real at the level of vibe has a real flavour of sort of Spanish kind of Castilian uh, medieval this sort of sense of it, that one it, is kind of understand the other one I think would literally cost I don't know how many millions of pounds to do just that ceiling yeah which is just one ceiling in one and it really one would room. be yeah <laughs> now like if you were trying you could yeah. do it it would just yeah. be unbelievably like the money you'd have to spend yeah. would be ridiculous yeah these one this other one has um this like iron and they cast iron or bronze bosses or something it has much more of a that sort of slightly brutal edge that some medieval uh, wooden architecture has it's also like a lot of very good timber cu- carved stuck together carved yeah patterns on patterns like patterns that are, uh, have got a fractal quality yeah no he just can't stop can he, he just goes like deeper and yeah. deeper and deeper especially at this it's not that there, there is hierarchy and we are just at the this this these entertaining rooms are just crank everything up to Every surface has got to be in some way resplendent. Like, the most basic thing it can be is unbelievably swish marble polished. (laughs) But only under the condition that that is, like, covering the gap between two parabolic arches and a, like carved yeah. finial with a thing in the middle of it and then otherwise it it can sort of explode into these real riots of geometry and kind of gothic tracery so i don't know i mean it doesn't really matter what the program of these different rooms is i think that there's a dining room at the back and that the front ones are sort of more living spaces of different kinds but i mean you could sort of use any of them for anything big party halls you know there's galleries for musicians and yeah double you know doors that can kind of open and close spaces a big hall that you can have the kind of like reception in in the in this would be the big room in the um palladian plan it's basically triple height it's sort of yeah. like a square plan at the bottom and then well not triple height in the sense that it's three floors tall it would be more than that in a normal thing in the sense that it's three times as tall as it is wide yeah and it's got um it does have kind of gas to some extent like it's it's complicated there's like a stair going up on one side and there are sort of galleries looking into it there are also kind of screened galleries looking into it yeah and then the kind of uppermost level of it is this uh, kind of parabolic dome like very tall and thin with tiles and with little um in section the room is like the shape of an artillery shell yeah um with a big <laughs> <laughs> big but a dome that proportion yeah. on the top yeah very pointed predictably enough there's an unbelievable <laughs> so much of, stuff going on of there's a kind joidery, of joidery <laughs> yeah, iron work there's like an gilding in, there's an internal version of the sort of screening that we were talking about on the front of the building where again you can kind of look in and spy on people i don't know is this is this meant to act as a kind of there's a bit of it which is meant to work a bit like a chapel, but I think that might be somewhere else in the building. The chapel is the um, like enormous gilded box behind the double doors. It can sit about eight. That's off the room next to this one, no? Yeah. Like, sort of off this room. Yeah. And there's a large pair of tall double doors. Yeah. And you open it, and now you have this... Is it, I don't know if it's gilded or polished brass. I think probably polished brass, kind of crinkled very, very tall gold box that feels like it should be holding a statue. And originally there was a shrine in there. Yeah, and on either side there are very compact um, kind of pews. Yeah, but really it feels like it's a space for you've got your big hall, 
you close the doors, you open the doors, and inside is a completely gold box. Yeah. And not just gold, but kind of crushed gold. Yeah. Crushed gold, and originally a very elaborate altar. It feels more like something that you have off the side of a very rich church, where you're keeping a kind of saint's statue, more than a family um, shrine chapel i think do we do we have any pictures of it because it is so i'm I'm not sure i do have a picture of that one uh we could drop one in though yeah there is like an interesting thing which is that it gets smaller as it goes up and those overhangs are partly created with steel beams which are expressed they're riveted that that is shown they're they're kind of presented as a kind of expressed edge and the like little rivets are are quite kind of visible it's like funny the way that that butts up against these like super lux um, golds and everything else. I think it's quite, it's quite deliberate. We talked about like Ruskin and um, the craftsman and like the level of craft detail that goes into this, which yeah. is extraordinary. And we also talked about Le Duc. Le Duc, sorry. You use the materials of the day. He's got arches and corbels in brick and stone. And then he's got these um, wrought iron beams, riveted wrought iron beams, which would be a feature of industrial architecture of this period. You yeah, know, you can have your arches of Catalan vaulting, vaulting yeah. between wrought iron beams, and he's put them in here. Yeah, and it's contemporary architecture, right? Um, it's a kind of warehouse making technology, um, and we've just got a little bit of it, yeah, inserted into this super lux space we also have a classic barcelona is quite a lot further south than here yes so they actually have daylight the weather is better and the sunlight is a bit more reliably strong yes <laughs> and we've got something that um will come up a few times in um the fancy gaudi buildings which is a kind of inverted light well where it's yeah. roofed and then you punch through the top in this case with i mean they're not thermal windows but it's not utterly dissimilar to that so yeah. underneath the springs of the arches that make up the top of the dome is where the light comes in for this incredibly uh, tall space and i think that helps make the incredibly tall space work better as an in as an internal yeah because it kind of resets the height above it still adds to the grandeur, but yeah. kind of disappears off into darkness yeah. compared to the light, which kind of sets a secondary ceiling and allows the space to be uh, more humane. Also, the uh, dome is pierced in lots of places to let yeah, in, like starlight. Yeah. You know. Get a little bit of starlight, yes. A very accomplished, fancy version of this thing, which is... It's like a total... Well, total, total maximum consumption architecture. Yeah, and total design, like... So yeah. was every element of everything is completely designed. The work itself is very kind of syncretic in a certain way, like it's synthesizing a lot of different bits. Um, it's also like completely like enveloping and kind of coherent and yeah. Yeah, but it's it does like, work. I mean, he's, and he's introducing vibe. all these things together. But he's kind of abstracted and turned them down enough that that you can put in that much stuff yeah, and it still look okay. Well, you know, other people are putting lots and lots of stuff in buildings at this time. It is a time of gratuitous wealth. Yes. And they often look ridiculous. No, with this one, it is very coherent. It all hangs together. There is one other very cool thing on the first floor, which is on the back, there's like a big internal light well. And there's this extremely steampunk kind of bay window which kind of bulges out of the middle of those three back rooms it's a kind of curving bay window very high it actually goes up and is sort of expressed on the floor above as well and it's got all of these like external venetian blinds also a kind of elaborate and designed in system of like tiny paris sort of um canopies or something yeah with like a sort of faience uh I don't know how. To, what like what would you even describe this as? They're, they're like little, they're almost like little mansard things going over the top of each of these tiny, like windows or something. It's super fiddly. It looks like the radiator hood of some. It looks kind like of, a huge, uh, like of, vent at the back of a jet engine or something. But designed in like late Empire French style. Also, <laughs> every material 
when I first saw pictures of this, I assumed all the slats were wood. Yeah. Because it would make sense. And then it was sort of... T- no, I think the whole thing is bronze. Yeah. Um, Like, all the little, like, levers and clicks are bronze. Yeah. Uh, it- uh, and wrought iron, and then, yeah, these thick glazed faience tiles in very plastic shapes. Very swish. It looks mega cool, very modern. Yeah, if, like, Napoleon III had, like, a supersonic aircraft or something. It's like the, it's yes. hard to convey it's what a weird what, what a weird fusion it is, and then the top has got this this kind of like fence that yeah. makes a kind of billowing skirt yeah. coming out to make the top of this rocket. It's very very compelling. I mean, this. something that I f- I feel that this is weirdly slightly related to, but it seems quite different. Is there's those fence towers on the top of the Palace of Westminster? Yeah, um, which are very articulated. Yeah, super just art- ventilation towers. Uh, which are a bit earlier than this. And it feels like, I mean, it is just a bay window, but it really feels like it should have an enormous air conditioning unit at the bottom of it. It'd be like sucking in air. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's just sort of shading, but it feels like it should be billowing out, yeah, like yeah. slightly radioactive kind of fumes of some kind. It's definitely expressing industrial. Yeah. Because why does that one have all of that, you know, why? I don't know. It's really and then to the, express... The, the interior of it has the, like this built-in seat with this like Im- embossed silver. Like it's it, everything is like a jewelry box in this house. It's completely, <laughs> it's completely mad. But they built the whole thing in like two years. I think that the um, must have had a lot of a lot of. They had a lot of money. A lot of people on site, I would think. They had a lot of people. They had a lot of stuff on site. I think that he was making so much money that he couldn't even he couldn't spend it fast enough. Yeah. Like there's um in the biography there's a bit of detail. I think that there was a bit of a kind of um tension between uh, Gaudi and this guy Ramon Pico who was the who was Guell's accountant and was himself also like a poet obviously but like um saying like <laughs> <laughs> poet accountant. Poet accountant. Yeah, as as one uh, was in the 1880s. Um the um but like saying like I fill um Don Guell's pockets and Gaudi empties them. I think you just had license to spend it basically infinite money and um, it was fine. Then, I mean, the upper rooms, there's sort of less to say. I mean, they're kind of fascinating little spaces. I think we should gloss it's over them quite quickly. But for they're... what is essentially the living quarters, they are very grand. Well, they're quite, they're quite, but they are swish, but they're quite like the, the rooms are much smaller. They're much more, they're much more stripped down at the level of detail as well. There's some quite like fascinating details. Like there's this one where, yes, as in much more stripped down. Like you well, know, they're you, like the level of like an elaborate church. For you example, can have rather some, than you, you can have some like plain stonework or something. Yeah, you know, which has not been polished within an inch of its life and have weird little um, flutings put it on it on it and everything. Yeah, there's this interesting one which is like where there's a kind of applied wrought iron thing, like a kind of drawing on top of the stone. Yeah. This kind of creating this, what's like the column capital and some kind of ornament. I mean, it's very, to me, know. a lot of this feels like Gaudi is playing with, trying on for size a whole load of different uh, kind of nouveau or contemporary ideas. Uh, and even more so perhaps in these upper floors where it doesn't matter so much, there's various things that feel like, oh, that... That's a kind of Art Nouveau fireplace. Yeah. Um, and he's experimenting with these... T- it's fairly early on in his career that he's doing this. And I think this will have been an amazing learning experience for him. Even yes. though it is obviously extremely accomplished. Yeah. Even these bits which feel like slightly more incongruous. If put in a different context, you would think that's perfectly happily yeah. resolved. It's just not... Um, it's just not been through the like last level of design polish that yeah. you might get with something else. And then the other famous bit is the roof. The roof is yeah. uh, an inhabitable roof. Um, you can walk around on top of it, and it's got it's w- one of the places where these there are these like famous sculptural chimneys covered in uh, broken tile. And um, yeah, I think that I mean there was there is a t- there's a like a kind of prototypical version of this on. Casa Vicens, but like this is where they they're much really... much more stripped back on Casa Vicens. Yeah, you know, Palladio didn't get to put all his statues on the roof. Yeah, Gaudi, yeah. he's from a richer period. Yeah. Barcelona's got a lot more money than Vicenza. He yeah. can put all the ridiculous statues on the roof that he likes. Yeah, and he's gonna do it. 
Yeah. And his statues are... They're kind of strange mushrooms. Brightly coloured mushroomy things. What can you say about these? So these are, I think, some of the most reproduced bits of the whole building. And they're, they're you know, along with the, like, strange lizard in um, Parkwell or whatever. Yeah. I mean, bits... he does these on various buildings, which are, yeah. are very noted upon. And were at the time. Probably the ones in Casimir that we'll talk about later are probably yeah. the most famous, maybe. Yeah. But... The roofscape is, you can walk on it, yeah. But it's kind of like a set of different terraces. There's the top of the dome, yeah, with its starlights poking through in a strange language for rich. It's made of kind of grotto stone, yes, all stuck together. And then these finials, which sprout up, they tend to be a, a chimney column and a cone. Yeah. And then the cone is sculpturally decorated, fluted, covered in bobbles, covered in diamonds, which yeah. are sort of sunk in, um, like like V-shaped vents. And then uh, that, in, and then the whole thing is covered in brightly coloured broken glass or um, tile. These ones here are are kind of the luxe version. Later on, they would get r- more and more raw and more like kind of wabby. Corb does this. He puts, like, weird things on the roof. So the roof is somewhere you can put, like, weird sculptural things. They're very brightly coloured, geometric, but not, uh, like, like quite symmetrical, but not totally symmetrical. Yeah. Somewhat biomorphic, but not very animal, mineral, vegetable. Probably more mineral, but sometimes vegetable. I feel these are genuinely idiosyncratic. Now, sure, on the, like, defensive normality, you can go, okay, well, decorated chimney tops, that's a, like, very well-established thing. Yeah. You know, the Tudor ones, uh, the 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 Italian ones we have with Palladio, they look yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. They've got cool ones in Venice. I bet they've got cool vernacular ones in Barcelona that I don't know about, Catalonian ones. Um, but then you're like, these are just so far. Yeah. He's got a long, a lot of steps from that. Do you want to make that the end of the episode? I think that that could be one episode, yeah. yeah. That was the Palaguel. That was the Palaguel. I mean, we've talked for yeah, we've talked for about an hour now, so I think we could we could have a shorter episode there. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of other Gaudi buildings next, and get onto a sort of there's to- some a, good ones, um, some possibly less good ones. Yes, and we're also going to get into a little bit of him and. Uh, his context and his relationship to God, religion, all that kind of thing. The great imponderables. Um, but, yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, remember that we will be posting a load of images. Um, uh, some of the images that we're looking at at this moment will be appearing on various platforms. You can follow us at about underscore buildings, um, where there'll be all sorts of curated stuff being posted by Matt. Matthew Lord Roberts is our editor. I need to remember to say that. Yeah, uh, he's, he's, he's doing. We, doing I, I don't think we could function without him. <laughs> he's do, must be doing sterling work on picking all of the nonsense we talked on the last episode. You can find all kinds of other links and things related to the podcast at our website about buildings and cities.org. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much. All right. Bye bye. <laughs>